people dropping in shortly. Um, this is our debut uh, female tech talk collective. So we've never done this before. So it's definitely a, a unique and special sneak peek into some of the things that our residents do during um, the code Smith immersive. Uh, one, one of my favorite things about the immersive, immersive is that you are kind of trained to be a really well-rounded engineer. So you're encouraged um, to explore the industry at large, and you're also given the opportunity to present on different topics that are really interesting to you that you might not be specifically covering in the immersive or diving as deep as you'd like to go um, in the immersive. So it's a really cool opportunity. And so this is our first time taking some of those talks live to all of you. Um, and today, we have Genevieve who is talking on our new features of React, which will be really cool. And then we will have Shannon teaching on data modeling. And then we will have Jae Hyun doing streaming protocols. So a really nice group of topics. Um, and with that, I will start it off. I will stop sharing so that our first panelist, Genevieve, can start sharing. Um, and let me know if you can share your screen, Genevieve. I think you have the ability to. Let's see. Thumbs on slides, can see all those? Sweet. Yeah, today I'm gonna to talk to you about some new, re, uh, new features that are coming in React 18. Before I do that, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Genevieve Annabelle and I am a, an, a fellow at the Los Angeles Immersive Program at CodeSmith. So I finished my residency in uh, January and I've been working for, as a fellow for about six weeks now. So I get to help with uh, things like code review, I get help with some approach lectures, take people through hack hours, which are our daily hour for sol solving algorithms and mentor junior OSP groups. And it's awesome. This is my favorite job I've ever had, for sure. Uh, before this, I was actually a personal trainer and a kickboxing instructor for the past four or five years. So I did a pretty hard 180 pivot. And I did have some technical or STEM background. I studied chemical engineering at UCSB in college. And so I've always been mathematically minded and I did some programming classes in college, not web development per se, more like mathematical computation and stuff. And I really loved it. But when I finished, I just didn't want to be a chemical engineer and my heart wasn't in it. So I was a personal trainer for a few years and then I discovered CodeSmith and took a gamble and it was the best decision I've ever made. I love it. So now I'll talk to you about React. So uh, just a little overview of React. I imagine both, most of you are somewhat familiar with what React is. Um, React is an open source JavaScript library for building user interfaces born at a little mom pa shop known as Facebook. And what re really sets React apart from other frameworks is the powerful features and concepts that it introduced like JSX, the virtual DOM and its use of components, just to name a couple. Uh, there's so much to say about React that's challenging to summarize, and that's not the purpose of today's talk. So I just wanted to quickly touch on uh, the high overview of React and just remind everyone how much easier it has made to create dynamic web applications because it requires a lot less coding and offers more functionality than saying just using vanilla JavaScript. So uh, if you have used React in the last couple of years, you've probably been using React 17, because that's what there's been unless you've already downloaded the beta version of React 18. So in uh, June of last year, so June 2021, the years are all jumbled now. Yes, June 2021, uh, React announced React 18. And then in November of last year, they released a beta version you can pull down. And actually that was all that was available last time I gave this talk. But excitingly, a week ago today, I think March 8th, they released their RC, their release candidate version, which is exciting because it's moving along and they're getting the bugs worked out and it's gonna be fully available to us soon, hopefully. So today I'm gonna to highlight three of the exciting new features that are being introduced with the Active Team. Uh, we're gonna go over a significant out of the box improvement. We're gonna talk about some new APIs and we're gonna talk about new streaming server rendered. All right, so before I get into each of those, uh, you're gonna hear me say, oops, talk about concurrent rendering quite a bit in this talk. talk. Yeah, so the major theme of this release is concurrency, which is just the ability to execute multiple tasks simultaneously. And this is a new opt-in mechanism that's been added to React 18. 
This is what is going to allow React to prepare multiple versions of the UI at the same time. And this changes mainly behind the scenes, but it unlocks a lot of new possibilities that improve both real and perceived performance of your application. So first, let's talk about automatic batching. So probably the most talked about out of the box improvement that's coming with React 18 is automatic batching. And batching is when React groups multiple state updates into a single re-render for better performance. So this is not new to React. It already does this, and it's always done this, but there are some major, major improvements coming with the React 18. So for example, if you have two state updates inside of the same click event, as you can see in this box in the red here, React has always batched these into one re-render, which is great. So what happens is if you run this code, you'll see every time you click, React only performs a single render, although you have set state two times. So this is awesome for, for, for performance because it avoids unnecessary re-renders. And it also prevents your components from re-rendering half-finished states where only one state variable is uploaded, which causes bugs. So a real life example that I read that I thought helped illustrate this is uh, when you go out to a nice like multi-course dinner, once you know what you want, your server comes, he takes your appetizer order, your first course, your main course, and you're maybe not your dessert yet, maybe. Uh, so he takes a couple different courses, takes it back to the kitchen, and then he courses it out for you and sends it out in batches rather than just asking for your appetizer, asking for your first, asking for your main. So that is what this sort of automatic batching does. So we love that React does this. However, it has been really inconsistent about when it batches updates. So for example, if you need to fetch data and then update the state in a handle click function, then React would not batch the updates and it's actually gonna perform two independent updates. And this is because React used to only batch updates during a browser event, like a click per se. So you can see if our code is written instead like this, we would be updating the state after the event has already been handled in the fetch callback here in this example, and therefore cause a re-render. So up until React 18, we only batched updates during the React event handlers. So that means any updates that were inside of promises, set timeout, native event handlers, et cetera, were not batched in React by default until now. With a super cool new fe feature in React called create root, all of the updates are gonna be automatically batched no matter where they originate from. So create root. Uh, when you first install React 18, you're gonna get a warning in the console. It's gonna say, React, React DOM render is no longer supported in React 18, and it's gonna suggest that you use create root instead. So I'm not gonna get into the details in this talk about how to do this, but here's an example of what it's gonna look like that you can see on their documentation. And so you will be able to import and invoke create root in order to do this automatic batching. And as a result, you're gonna create a more efficient app. All right, another exciting new feature of React 18 is this new API, Start Transition. So if you uh, have any experience building apps, we've probably all experienced that building a fluid and responsive app is not easy. And small actions like clicking the button or typing in an input can cause a lot to happen on the screen. So let's go ahead and consider a situation where you'd be typing in an input field that filters through a list of data. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what this might look like. So in this example, you need to store the value of the field in state so that you can filter the data and control the value of that input field. And then whenever the user types a character, we then update the input value and use the new value to search the list and show the results. And what happens sometimes in large screen updates is that this can cause a lag on the page while everything renders and it makes typing or other interactions feel like pretty slow and unresponsive. So even if the list you're searching through is not too long, the list items themselves might be complex and they might be different on every keystroke and there might be not a clear way to optimize their rendering. So let's think about what's actually conceptually happening here for a moment. The issue going on is that there are two different updates that need to happen. The first update is an urgent update to change the value of the input field and potentially some UI that surrounds it. 
The second update is a less urgent update to show the results of the search. Users will expect that the first update is going to be immediate because the native, brow native browser handling for these interactions is really fast. But the second update might be a bit delayed. And users don't expect it to be completely immediate, which is good because there may be a lot more work to do. But up until now, all updates were rendered urgently. So what this means was that the two states we're looking at here would still be rendered at the same time and would still block the user from seeing the feedback from their interaction until everything rendered. What we're missing is a way to tell React which updates are urgent and which updates are not. And we can do this by using a new API in React 18, Start Transition. So the new Start Transition API solves this issue by giving you the ability to mark updates as transitions. So updates wrapped in Start Transition are handled as non-urgent and will be interrupted if more urgent updates like clicks or like presses come in. And if a tra transition gets interrupted by the user, for example, maybe a user types in multiple characters in a row, React will go ahead and throw out the stale rendering work that wasn't finished and render only the latest update. And then transition lets you keep the most inter, uh, keeps most interactions snappy, even if they lead to significant UI changes. And they also avoid, they also let you avoid wasting time rendering content that is irrelevant now. The final new feature I am going to highlight from React is the suspense API. So I don't have a whole lot to say about this, but I definitely want to touch on it. Uh, React 18 has some substantial architectural improvements that improve React server-side rendering performance. So server-side rendering is a way of rendering the JavaScript data to HTML on the server to save computation on the front end. And this results in a faster initial page load in most cases. So the developers at React have been working on these improvements for years and spending a lot of work on them. Most of them are behind the scenes and I'm not gonna get further into them today, but it's gonna make a significant efficiency improvement in React 18. So I just wanted to touch upon it. So will this break my app? <laughs> now, if you have been following React's research on React 18, which maybe some of us nerds have been, <laughs> or you just heard me say concurrent mode and thought, hell no, that's going to break my app. <laughs> or maybe for those of you who get a headache just hearing the words updated version, because you might have dealt with the nightmare of version compatibility issues in the past. Uh, don't worry, you're not alone. The developers at React heard developers' concerns and listened to the community's feedback and they have a solution. So rather than introduce concurrent mode in an all or nothing sort of manner, it's gonna be released through gradual adoption. And so no, this will not break your app. What this means in practice is that you're gonna be able to adopt React 18 without any rewrites and just try out the new features at your own pace as you choose. And this is gonna happen through a gradual adoption strategy. So since concurrency in React 18 is opt-in, there are no significant out of the box breaking changes to your component behavior. Uh, you're gonna actually, your app, even when you pull down React, your app is gonna run as if it's running in React 17 still. And then once you install React 18, if you change no code, it's going to act exactly like it did in React 17, and then you will choose to implement new features as you're at your own pace. And that is it for my talk on React. That was awesome. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> um, oh so we do have some time for Q&A. So if anyone has um, you know, a specific question that they're dying to ask, this is a great time. Either use the raise hand feature or the chat. Um, React was definitely something new to me, so I learned a ton. So I have a question if no one else has, wants to jump in. Perfect, okay, I will ask my question. Um, going back to that new um, API you were telling us about, Start, tra start Transition, um, can you explain how that's different to this to, from Set Timeout? Uh, yeah, I can. So it's a good question. Uh, so there's a couple important differences between set timeout and start transition and reasons that you might choose to use one over the other. And if you can remember the slide that I showed, actually, I'll just click back to it on start transition. 
Uh, yes. Okay. So if you were here to instead wrap this in set timeout, which is a common solution to this problem that we're trying to solve, uh, this will also delay the second update until after the first one is rendered. But there are some differences in how it's going to do it. So the first main one is that a large screen update instead of set timeout, excuse me, <laughs> um, a large screen update instead of set timeout or sorry, inside of the set timeout, it's still gonna lock up the page just later after that timeout. So if the user is still typing or interacting with that page, when the timeout fires, they will still be blocked from interacting with the page at all. And the state, but the state updates marked with tra start transition are uninterruptible. So they're not gonna lock up in the same way. Uh, so that is one major difference. And then I'd say another one, is it's important to keep in mind that because set timeout just delays the update, uh, showing a loading indicator requires to write you write the asynchronous code, which is often pretty brittle. And with transitions, React is actually able to track the pending state for you. And the update is based on the current state of the transition. So that's going to give you the ability to show the user the loading feedback while they wait. Those are a couple of the reasons. Very cool. Super, super interesting. Um, does anyone else? Oh, Jay John, you have a question. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the super interesting and informative talk, Genevieve. Um, I just had a really quick question about the API, um, um, like something suspense or or something like that. Um, um, I don't remember the exact okay. name. Yes, the suspense yeah. API, yes, because I know it says that it's going to improve uh, React server size rendering. Do you know if this is also going to improve React's like uh, search engine optimization capabilities? I am not sure. I would imagine it would, but I haven't looked into it. I will. If you look it up before me, let me know, please. <laughs> okay. I honestly have no clue either, but just. Yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. But <laughs> All right. It would be helpful if it did too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, without further ado, we are going to pass it over to Shannon, who is going to do data modeling. Um, so yeah, dive on in. I'm excited. Awesome. Cool. Um, let me just get set up. All right. And then I guess just before I start, I'll also do just a quick intro. Um, so I'm Shannon. I am also a fellow. Um, I think I started being a fellow like five, six weeks ago. I lose track of time, but that's when I graduated from the program. And before Coachsmith, I was actually working in like academic research. So I also studied something STEM like, like Genevieve, but I was doing biology. Um, and now I'm here, also took the gamble and also am really enjoying my time as well. Um, but cool, let me move this. Um, and I'm going to be talking about data modeling. So before we get started, I'm just gonna go over kind of a quick agenda for what we're gonna be covering. So to start off, we're just gonna start with like a few high level definitions. Um, and then we'll move into the three different types of data modeling along with how we actually depict relationships in our data models. And then after that, we're gonna discuss different types of um, data models. And so while there are a lot of different types, we're going to focus on three of the most popular. So in this case, relational, object-oriented, and object-relational. Cool. So to the high-level definitions, let's just start by defining a database. So a database is just a collection of organized information or just data, right? Um, but in order to retrieve, store, and like manipulate that data in any kind of way, we typically need a database management system. So something like MySQL, if any of you have heard of that, um, which uses SQL as its query language, or MongoDB, which uses something called MQL or MongoDB query language um, as its query language. Cool. And then so, but my talk is on data models, right? <laughs> so we also need to talk about what a data model is. So a data model, just like any other kind of model, it's just some kind of representation of something. So in this case, it's going to represent the logical structure of what our data should look like. Um, and 
modeling our data is going to help us figure out really important things like relationships between our um, entities or how each individual thing is connected uh, and how we should be able to store and use that data. Uh, so keep in mind that most database management systems are typically built around certain data models. So for example, MySQL, SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server are standard relational databases that use a relational data model. And then we're going to go a little bit into the three levels of data modeling. Um, so each uh, level, so as we follow this arrow down, uh, each level offers like increasing concreteness and decreased abstraction. So um, that's kind of the general trend as we follow this arrow. So a conceptual model is a very high level view of the uh, data and is the most abstract, least detailed kind of model. Um, next is the logical model, which provides a little bit more detail. And we're going to touch on this um, more as we move. So <laughs> it's not, this is not the last time you'll see this. We'll talk about this more, but logical model kind of just sits right in between. Um, and the physical model is the most detailed and very concrete. Um, I would say not very abstract there. Oops. There we go. Okay. So I think this is really good for looking at the three different levels. So on the left, we see that our conceptual model, it has no attributes filled into like each table, but it does have kind of these like basic names of each entity. Um, whereas in the logical model, which is kind of like the middle ground, we see a lot more detail. Um, so typically we add relationship information. So how these tables are connected, uh, so things like one-to-one -one or one-to-many. And then we've also filled in kind of all these attributes. So like all of these labels in here, we've now filled those in um, for a more kind of concrete type of model. And then on the right, the physical model here uh, offers, you know, a lot of details. So at this stage, we've actually filled in all the relevant information. We need to generate DDL statements. Uh, which can be deployed to a database server to eventually create our database. And so if anyone is familiar with SQL, we know that we have like create queries, uh, query statements, we have like update, you know, delete, tons and tons of SQL statements. But these statements are actually broken down into different categories. Um, so DDL stands for data definition language. And DDL statements help us perform tasks like create and drop, most notably. So in this case, create is what's going to actually bring our database into existence, um, which is great. Um, so arguably the most important thing about physical data models that's kind of left out in the previous two levels of models is that they consider a specific um, like technical, technological context um, that again is missing in the logical and conceptual models. So in other words, they are designed to be specific now to a target database management system. So this physical data model brings us very close to like the actual form of our ideal database, um, which is really important before we you know, actually get started. We want a very accurate, very concrete, um, representation of how we want our database to look. And then in all levels of modeling, depicting relationships between each entity is super important. But in most situations, we typically want to know more than the fact that two entities are connected. We want to know like how they're connected. Um, so we want to know, like, is this relationship one-to-one, one-to-many, or many-to-many? -many? And this is also car called cardinality, uh, or the nature of a relationship. So we have a few different ways to depict relationships in our models. So on the top, we see Barker notation here, or crow's foot notation, because this thing uh, presumably looks like <laughs> crow's foot. Um, and then down here, we have something called Chen's notation. 
And so both here actually depict a one-to-many relationship. Um, but something to note just as a kind of quick aside is that you very frequently, I would say, see Barker's notation and Chen's notation is less frequently seen, uh, probably because, you know, it just takes up more space. You do need to add this like green diamond between each of your relationships. So just something to note um, before moving on. And then as for going into what each type of relationship kind of is or examples of each, we have these pretty the simplest type of relationship is just one to one relationships. Um, so I think a really great example of this is just one person has one social security number, right? And one social security number belongs to one person and only one person. Um, and that's, you know, a really great way to think about one to one relationships. Um, whereas with one to many things start to get a little bit more complicated, but one-to-many and many-to-many -many relationships are typically what we're going to see in the real world. Um, relationships are not that simple most of the time. So um, yeah, an example of a one-to-many relationship is um, like one student can enroll in a specific course just once, right? But that same course can enroll 20, 30, 50 students. Um, so that is a one-to-many relationship there. And then for many-to-many, -many, I think a good way to think about it is books and authors. So one book, of course, could have multiple authors, but um, one author could have also written multiple books. So you kind of get this branched relationship on both sides now. And then we're just gonna talk about different types of data models now, uh, moving past kind of relationships. And this is just a quick roadmap for how we're gonna discuss these three types. So we're gonna to touch on relational first and then object-oriented, object-relational. And so the relational uh, data model is the most common, I would say, arguably. And it uses tables, also known as relations, um, to represent data. So it just looks like a normal table, right? <laughs> we have rows and columns, but in this case, uh, each column actually represents a specific attribute of the table. So for example, if our table in general holds student information, um, each of these columns might be uh, things like name, birth date, grade, um, attributes that apply for each student. Um, and this means that each row then contains specific information about one student. Um, yeah, and then each row actually, you can call these tuples. I don't see that that often, but that is something that they're called uh, just as a heads up. But another really important thing with this model is that every row has a unique identifier called the primary key. Uh, and this should you know, be unique and it should never change or be subject to change. Um, otherwise, it's gonna give you a lot of issues and it also should not be null as well. Um, great, so at this point, we kind of just have isolated tables or data like floating around in um, just like by themselves, right? So how do we go about kind of depicting these relationships uh, in our models. And so for relational databases, the answer is through foreign keys. So uh, here, the customer number field represents a foreign key, which is pretty much just like a link or a pointer to another table. Um, so this is how we start to actually form kind of pointers uh, that will link up our tables. So this is really important because it helps us reduce redundancy in our database because in the orders, like if the same customer places, I don't know, 500 orders or something in the course of a year, uh, then we're gonna have this customer number field in every single um, um, entry in the orders table, right? And so by using this foreign key, we can really reduce that redundancy. Um, another really important point to understand with relational models 
is referential integrity. So this basically makes sure that every foreign key is pointing at something that actually exists. So in this example, if we think about, for whatever reason, if you try to delete the customer's table, um, you know, what's gonna happen? Like, where is the customer number foreign key going to be pointing at if we delete that table? And so the answer is kind of that your database management system is not going to be happy if you try to do this. Most likely it's gonna prevent you from doing this in the first place. And that is all so that we can, you know, prevent these kind of orphan tables um, in any case. So it really helps just protect against unpredictable behavior. Cool. And then in the object oriented model, so this is a different kind of model, objects are going to take the place of tables we saw in relational databases. So data just gets stored in objects and then each object is going to be an instance of a class. Um, and so it's pretty much just a very different way to, to uh, structure, store, you know, uh, model our data. And then object relational models are kind of cool because they're a hybrid between relational models and object oriented models. So some examples of this are Oracle and Postgres, which actually we learn a lot of Postgres in the residency. So that's great to know, but pretty much um, Oracle, for example, offers both object um, stores where you can store only objects and also relational tables where you can store objects uh, with table data. Cool. And then just to summarize, uh, we went over the three levels of data models, again, kind of talking about how they go from super abstract to a very like concrete uh, kind of model. And then we talked about relationships, cardinality, and um, how we can depict those relationships in our models. And then lastly, we just touched on three really popular types of, of data models. Um, this is my, uh, my contact information. So feel free to connect with me. And then I also have a resources slide if you are curious about or want to do more reading uh, into any of these topics. But cool, thanks everyone for, for coming out. Yay, yes. we have a question. Yes. Roy, take it away. Hi, my name is Okoroi, and I just wanted to thank you for coming in and speaking to us. And I just have a couple of, or a few short questions. I was just wondering why there are so many variations of SQL, like, you know, NoSQL, Postgres, MySQL, and I'm sure there's, there's many more that I don't know right now. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. I think, um, you know, to be honest, I don't, I'm not familiar with a whole ton. I think in the resources slide, you can do a little bit more reading into each one specifically. But like, for example, I know Postgres and Oracle, which people call them SQL databases, but um, they are technically object relational models. So they're kind of like that hybrid between mm -hmm. object um, oriented models and relational models. So that's kind of like what sets, I think, at least Postgres apart from some of the more typical relational um, database management systems like MySQL, I think is a good example of one. Does that answer your question kind of? Yeah, it, it does. Okay. Thank you. Got it. <laughs> sure. The other question is, um, the many to many relationship, because mm -hmm. I know it's the most complicated one, right? Out of all of them. I, I was just wondering yeah. if you had like a visual example of, of the, the model, the models, how they would look here. Gotcha. Um, I it, do not, not that, that's but fine. I can look it up. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. Let's see. Um, yeah, I do not, but if okay. you kind of think about what it would look like visually, if you think about like this graphic as being just like a super simple representation of a type of relationship, this would be something like one to, or sorry, many to many, right? Because each person, uh, 
no, that doesn't work. I don't think that <laughs> is a good representation, but there are definitely a lot of good uh, visuals online. I think that you can find. Um, yeah, sorry, I did not. Good. And my <laughs> just final question is within this uh, data visualization, where in program programming does it fit into? Is it like just by itself, like data database management, or is it like just the server side, or like where where does it really fit in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think so. You typically have like a client side where you're kind of rendering all the information with React, like Genevieve talked about, or you know, really any um, front end is going to be how you get things on the screen. And then your back end is actually usually acts as a layer to connect with your database. Because if you think about real world applications, if you want your data to persist you need to store it in something that uh, will last more than like one session. And so that is where, like if you're trying to, to store maybe like what users have in a cart or something like that, well, what if they close their browser and try to come back without a database? You know, it's gonna be, I wanna say impossible to persist that data after, you know, a long period of time um or a short period of time but yeah does that help yes thank you perfect sure any other questions i think we have one in the chat and what's great okay. is that um all of our fellows um and grads are on slack so if you have a question or you want a follow-up from a question you've asked feel free to connect them on slack but we'll get you guys to uh, put your your slacks to the channel later. Um, but our last question is, are data models language um, agnostic? Um, I'm familiar with data models with Rails, but does Node treat it similarly? I'm not sure if. Uh... Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I would say yes, because I don't know, maybe you guys know more than me. <laughs> it looks like people are coming from SQL backgrounds. But my understanding is that data models are language agnostic in that they are just like, representations of um you know what we want our database to look like whereas when we work with database management systems so stuff like postgres and um mysql stuff like that we're using the sql query language uh, i guess that's kind of a language to you know store and delete and basically change around our our data, but I think for the models themselves, because they're just kind of more abstract representations of how our database should look, I think that I would consider them language agnostic. Thank cool. you. Awesome. Sure, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, okay, perfect. I'm going to hand it off to our next uh, speaker, Jay Hyun, who's doing streaming protocols, which is going to be really exciting. So I'll let you take it away. All right. I'm just going to try and start sharing screen. Um, can everyone see my uh, slide? Oh, great. Perfect. So before I get into my talk, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce myself really quickly here. So my name is Jaehyun. I am a uh, engineering fellow for the New York Immersive Program. I just started the fellowship just I think two weeks ago now. So it's been a really exciting process getting onboarded on. Um, before Codesmith, I had a couple of different jobs. My most recent being working as a digital strategist for a marketing agency. And before that, I worked as a lab assistant in a fertility medical center. So a lot of pivots here and there. Um, I do not have a technical background other than my experience as a laboratory assistant because uh, when I was in college, I graduated with a degree in art history and anthropology, um, but I did have a really strong interest in technology and how the internet worked as abstraction. So you can kind of see that interest um, play into the topic that I chose for this tech talk here. Um, so yeah, with that being said, I'm just gonna jump right into it. All right. So my talk is obviously on streaming protocols. 
So streaming is a technology that most people use pretty much every day. Um, whether it is like watching your favorite television shows on Netflix or even watching a tech talk on Zoom, streaming forms the backbone of some of our favorite entertainment and communication platforms. But um, what is it exactly? Oops. Uh, to put in the simplest terms, streaming is the continuous transmission of multimedia from a server to client. Before streaming was widespread, the end user needed to have downloaded a copy of the entire file on their device's hard drive, and the content could not be played until that process was complete. In contrast with streaming, the content is able to be played without actually copying and saving it. The files are loaded a little bit at a time instead of the entire file loading at once, and the browser does not save this information locally. With an internet connection with sufficient bandwidth and compatible hardware, the end user can press play and begin watching TV or listening to music. That being said, streaming does refer broadly to the delivery method of content rather than the content itself. But for today, we're gonna to focus on audio and visual files. Um, today, we're gonna to go ahead and discuss streaming protocols and how it fits into the technologies that are used to make streaming possible. But to do that, we need an understanding of the sequence through which data is transmissioned from server to client. The first thing that happens is that the audio or video are compressed according to coding format or codec in order to make the file smaller. An audio file might be compressed into uh, like, for example, like MP3, Vorvis, AAC, or Opus, and video files might be compressed into H.264, uh, HEVC, VP8, or VP9. Then the compressed files are encoded into a container bitstream, which is essentially a sequence of bits. Uh, some of these bit streams include MP4, FLV, um, ASF, ISMA. Um, after files are encoded into a bit stream, it is delivered from a streaming server to the streaming client, such as the user's laptop, using a transfer protocol such as RTMP or RTP. And we'll return to these transfer protocols in just a moment. Um, and finally, once the bitstream reaches the end user, the client interacts with the streaming server using control protocols such as MMS or RTSP. So now we have a preliminary understanding of the technologies involved with streaming, we can finally ask, what exactly is a streaming protocol? Um, so streaming protocols, to put it in super simple terms, is uh, a set of procedures that regulate how multimedia is transferred across the web in addition to any errors that can occur during transfer. Um, protocols determine how the bitstream compressed from files from the organ server is transported to the client. In short, it is a specific method to deliver multimedia files. Um, here we have a diagram of the Internet Protocol Suite or the IP Suite, which is a standard network model and communication protocol stack used on the internet and most other computer networks. Um, here we can kind of see uh, where streaming protocols fit into a set of protocols that essentially make up the internet itself. Um, this diagram specifically organizes the internet into four abstraction layers from lowest to highest. Um, the link layer contains communication methods for data within a single network segment. The internet layer provides internetworking between independent networks. The transport layer handles host-to-host -host communication and the application layer is where the users uh, interact. The most important layer for streaming protocols is the transport layer, as streaming protocols are responsible for the transmission of your content to the end platform. Uh, this layer establishes basic data channels that applications use for task-specific data exchange, and streaming protocols uh, operate on this layer. So there are two broad ways you can transfer data on the web on that transport layer we just saw, and we're going to go ahead and examine them in the context of streaming. User Datagram Protocol, UDP, is a datagram-based protocol that sends the media stream as a series of small packets, which is a straightforward and efficient process. However, the protocol does not have a mechanism through which to guarantee delivery, which means that it's up to the receiving application to detect loss or corruption and recover that corrupted data using error correction techniques. It means that if the data is lost, the stream might suffer lapses in quality because there <clears throat> is no communication between the sending and receiving devices, the data cannot be sent in exact order. 
In contrast, the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, is a more reliable protocol that guarantees the delivery of each bit in the media stream. It accomplishes this by forcing communicating devices to establish a connection before transferring data. Uh, the multiple handshakes and confirmation steps between the server and client means that TCP is a more complex process with a system of timeouts and retries. When there is data loss in the network, the media stream stalls while the protocol handlers detect the loss and retransmit the missing data. This means delays for buffering, which might be acceptable with video on-demand scenarios, but will cause issues in live interactive settings. So streaming protocols are built with the two different transfer protocols that we've just examined. Many streaming protocols actually combine characteristics between UDPs and TCPs. That being said, the platform for which the streaming protocol is used affects whether UDP and TCP are used. On-demand video streaming is generally aligned with TCP. Uh, video streaming uses prefetching and buffering to achieve a smooth video playout. Um, and TCP provides the, such a buffer and the guarantee of a reliable transmission. In addition, TCP uses a network congestion avoidance algorithm that will control congestion which attempts to basically use all the available bandwidth between the, the server and client, which makes it easy to fetch content as quickly as possible. In addition, TCP also makes it easy to monitor the bandwidth between source and receiver, adapting the video quality of streaming as necessary. In contrast, live video streaming is more aligned with UDP because very little prefetching can be done in live streaming. UDP generally serves as a very basic transport layer uh, functionality, so it's used with other application layer protocols. Um, so you will very rarely see UDP used uh, on its own. That being said, these are broad generalizations, and there are many exceptions to these broad strokes, um, because oftentimes companies will create their own proprietary protocols to suit their business needs. Um, so we're going to go ahead and see this combination of TCP and UDP characteristics as we go through some of the most widely implemented streaming protocols that are out there. RTMP, or Real-Time Messaging Protocol, remains one of the most used streaming protocols and is supported by most streaming platforms and software. It was originally developed as a proprietary protocol by Macromedia for streaming between Flash Player, a server, and Adobe, which later acquired Macromedia, has released an incomplete version of the protocol for public use. RTMP is based on TCP and it maintains persistent, stable connections and allows for low latency communication. And here latency basically means uh, delay. It splits streams into fragments and their size is negotiated dynamically between client and server, which delivers streams smoothly. A disadvantage of RTMP is that it might introduce interruptions in case of low bandwidth. In addition, RTMP has relatively low security, which might cause issues with uh, firewalls that tend to be very tight. WebRTC, or Web Real-Time Communications Protocol, is the open source standard for real-time communication and is supported by nearly every modern browser. So it's often used by applications that provide peer-to-peer real-time teleconferencing. It is currently gaining in popularity because of its many strengths, it's the video codecs, as well as the Opus audio codec. Um, and WebRTC essentially transformed browsers into streaming terminals without any additional installations, and it supports sub-stake and latency, which eliminates delays. delays. Lastly, the protocol uses adaptive bitrate technology, which allows it to automatically adjust video quality and prevent any drops and interruptions. Um, and we'll go ahead and come back to adaptive bitrate streaming later. As for the drawbacks of WebRTC, it can have instability due to sub-second second latency. HTTP live streaming or HLS is the most widely used streaming protocol for live broadcasting and live streams, and is often used for video on demand content. Originally developed by Apple to drop flash from iPhones, HLS has wide support for desktop browsers, smart TVs, Androids, and iOS. And HTML5 video players also natively support HLS streaming. This means that the streams that use HLS can reach as many viewers as possible, allowing the live stream to be viewed by a large audience. 
In addition to high compatibility, HOS also de delivers great video quality because of its support for adaptive bitrate streaming and its support for the H.265 codec. The only downside is the latency can be quite high. The last stream protocol that we'll go over is um, MPEG Dash, which is dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP. Although this format is not widely used yet, it has some huge advantages. Like HOS, it supports adaptive bitrate streaming, which is great for delivering high quality streams with different internet speeds. V viewers will always receive the best quality that their current internet connection speed can support. In addition, MPEG Dash is open source, which means that organizations can customize it to suit their needs. It is also a codec agnostic, means, which means that it can be used with almost any streaming encoding format. However, there are downsides to using Dash. The biggest one is that there's limited support for the protocol. It is not um, compatible with iOS and Apple, which poses uh, huge problems. We mentioned previously that WebRTC, TCP, and Dash are protocols that use adaptive bit streaming. Adaptive bit streaming is a technique that works based on HTTP and designed to work efficiently over large distributed HTTP networks. It detects the user's bandwidth and CPU in real time and adjusts the quality of media accordingly. The source content is enco encoded at multiple bit rates with each bit rate segment like segmented into smaller packets on top of that. When the client begins the stream, it requests the segments from the lowest bitstream segments. And then if the network throughput is greater, then it requests a higher bit segment. If the network throughput deteriorates, it will require a lower bit segment. The adaptive bit rate algorithm then performs the function of analyzing the state of the network and deciding which bit rate segments are downloading. Broadcasters and studios use adapted bitrate technology to provide higher video quality with fewer resources. And um, bitrate technology has been adapted by media companies and has become integrated in many high-end streaming providers. So as an overview, streaming protocols are a way of determining how multimedia is transferred over the web. It is built using UDP or TCP, and the needs of a platform or broadcaster affects which streaming protocols are used. We went over um, a couple of widely used streaming protocols and their characteristics and how they align with certain use cases. Uh, and then finally, we went over adaptive bitrate streaming, which is uh, streaming technologies that use some of the most adaptive, uh, excuse me. Uh, we also went over adaptive bitrate streaming, which is a technology that a lot of the most adaptive streaming protocols use. Okay, with that being said, that concludes the end of my talk. Does anyone have any questions? Hold on. <laughs> I have a question, but happy to open up. Obviously, I don't want to be selfish. So if anyone else <laughs> has that's a question first, uh, either using the chat or a raise hand feature. Perfect. I guess it's my time to shine. Um, so I often hear things like video protocol, uh, video codecs, and video um, container formats in like the same conversation, sometimes kind of like inter interchangeably. So I just wanted to clarify, how do streaming protocols uh, differ from container formats and codecs? Yeah, so um, to kind of define everything all at once, uh, video streaming protocols, um, just to kind of iterate, are a set of procedures that regulate how multimedia is transferred across the web. Um, on the other hand, codec means video compression technology, which is the technology used to make uh, video files smaller in order to save space. Um, and I guess finally, uh, a container format uh, facilitates the transmission of video data by it basically works at a big box that contains the video file, timing information, subtitles, and other metadata that uh, the application would need. Awesome. I hope that answers your question. It does, it does. And we have um, two questions in the chat. Um, Sherry's asked, which streaming type do you use most now and why? That's a great question, Sherry. Um, Currently, I have not had the opportunity to work really closely with streaming protocols. Um, this is one of those topics that 
generally network specialists will work at, not so much um, software engineers, especially web uh, developers. But it is something that I would love to have experience uh, directly with in the future. So I, I can't answer which streaming type do you use most now. Um, but I would say like when it comes to like streaming protocols that are most like commonly used with uh, consumer technology, such as like Netflix, like HBO Max, et cetera, I would say that, let me go back in the slides, HTTP live streaming or some sort of technology that uses uh, HTTP uh, streaming protocols, those would be the most common. I hope that kind of answers your question, even though it's not really a direct answer. Um, with that being said, I guess I'll also um, answer Jamie's question. She writes, I don't know if I missed it, but I realized that WebRTC uses both UDP and TCP while the others only use TCP. Is there a benefit to use, using both UDP and TCP in conjunction? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the benefit of UD, UDP is that it's like so much faster than TCP because uh, TCP requires um, the server and client to be constantly in communication to each other. Whereas UDP, a good way to put it is that it just like throws information at the client um, so that it's really fast. However, it's not as like, um, uh, it, it's not as stable as TCP. So using them in conjunction um, kind of like balances like the pros and cons of each um, transfer protocol. If you have any additional questions, please just feel free to reach out at this link over here. Mm -hmm.